Welcome to The Skill Ranch. This podcast is designed to equip entrepreneurs, professionals, and consultants with skills to impact tomorrow's work environment. Now here's your host, Bilal. Hi, this is Bilal Vaseem and welcome to The Skill Ranch. On today's episode, I'm joined by Lisa Patrick. Lisa is your modern day Nancy Drew using her investigative strategic approach in the business, finding missing structures and amplifying existing ones to grow your business and build a legacy. You want a thriving thought leadership brand, not a surviving business? It's difficult to get an objective view and see the whole picture of your business when you're busy inside the picture frame. Welcome to the Skill Ranch podcast. How are you doing today, Lisa? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks, Bilal. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful as well. And I appreciate you taking time out to talk to me today on the Skill Ranch podcast. Well, I'm honored to be your guest. Thank you very much. So let's start with your background, Lisa. Could you please share a bit about your background to our audience? Sure. So I was born and raised in a very small town in uh, central Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, You know, the only daughter of uh, two, you know, I had an ordinary life, but I had extraordinary parents. And so they're both entrepreneurs. My father was an RCMP officer who retired and decided that back in the 70s that he was going to become a farmer. Um, And I don't know if many of you who are listening, um, but back in the 70s, you didn't just decide to become a farmer. It's not something that you typically did um, like we do now, pivoting and adapting in business. Um, But he did, and he was very successful at it. And uh, so it's really where I grew up really with the foundation of what hard work was. But more importantly, what a what a real unstoppable drive in nature um, that my parents have and still have today that instilled in me and, and has done me well throughout my entire career. And so after I left the farm, um, I moved into a law enforcement background uh, where I took law enforcement training and I worked for the city of uh, Edmonton in sex crimes for about six months and realized that that just was not the career path that I wanted. And so then I went back to school And while I was in school, I actually took a job as a private investigator. And that's when I really knew I was somewhat in the lane of where I needed to be at that particular time. And I went and I worked for a company after I graduated from college. And in that short amount of time, I realized what my dad had taught me growing up on the farm was a set of skills that I could use in the world to really build my own business. And I walked away after about six months of working for somebody else and have never walked back. I've only ever worked for myself. Um, so, you know, I'm in my, my golden years of the 40s, let's say, and uh, I love every bit of business and every adventure that's taken me to where I am today. Nice. That is quite a diverse background that starting on a farm to becoming a private investigator and now you are like helping individual become successful. There are a few key skills that you mentioned that were hard work, persistence, being motivated and being able to work in diverse background. If you relate that, uh, that thing to the current situation, there are many individuals who, are, who have problems such as like they've lost a job or they're lo- uh, they are being on a quarantine in a home, they are feeling lonely, there are health issues, etc. How would you go about maintaining the focus during such unprecedented times that uh, have never happened in majority of the population that is currently alive? Well, I think I would say, you know, Bilal, that crisis happens all the time. This is just, you know, at a, at a magnet at a much larger scale um, than what we're used to. So, you know, everybody reacts to crisis in different ways. Um, but I think the majority of us who are really mindful of the bigger picture, meaning um, we can only control what we focus on. So we cannot control the pandemic. We cannot control the behavior of others, but we can control our own environment. 
And so I think if people maintain focus on the control that you do have rather than what's out of control and something that you have no um, ability to make any changes or support and so forth, and you put your time and energy into the things that you can control, like your effort and your attitude, that will help you maintain your focus during these unpre unprecedented times in any crisis at any given time, COVID or not. Yes, and uh, let me just share with you a bit of the podcast background. So that podcast started in May. That was right in the middle of the crisis. But I was planning for it from from March onwards. So I had that like bigger picture of getting this thing done. And even during this pandemic time, along with my job and everything, I was able to create a podcast that adds value to individual and help them learn those skills that would make them more successful uh, once everything comes back to normal uh, if i will ask you for the past five months what have been your uh, some of your key learnings from this pandemic journey uh, as a professional and in your personal life that you would like to share with us well you know there's been a lot of learning that's happened i, I believe you know some not so good and some 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 great things have, have resulted from of it. First of all, you know, one of the things that I've really learned um, is that the language that we use when we have conversations really needs to be precise. People are looking for actionable, tangible um, advice and guidance. And the more precise and the more specific we are with our support, like you talked about, you know, creating the value, but strategic, precise value um, in the language that we use and the support that we give. Um, you know, you're a coach and, and you know the value of doing that. So, you know, I've learned a lot from other people um, around the language, first of all, that they use. Um, but more importantly, I think what I've really learned is the value that people place, um, how they react in crisis and how they treat others. You know, it's it's been interesting having conversations you know with um, many colleagues as well as clients and thinking that you truly know somebody and what they stand for and what they value versus when they're in crisis and their back is against the wall the way they react and the way they treat other people um, treat their spouses or family their employees really is a true indicator of who they genuinely are at the core of their being. And so I've been pleasantly surprised by some and, you know, disappointed by others in how they have treated others and their values have really come forefront um, during these last four months. And for me, one of the things that really has gotten me through um, Learn, you know, one thing that I've learned about myself, I guess I could say, is that, you know, many times people have told me that they do visualization exercises. I don't know, Bilal, if you do that or not, but I have never really bought into this whole idea that, you know, sit back and not so much meditate, but visualize and, and see yourself um, in five years and 10 years or, you know, six months, five months, whatever it happens to be. And I started to do a visualization exercise and I was pleasantly shocked at how effective it's been. Um, so that for me has probably been one of my most key individual personal learning um, exercises, if you will, or about me that I never knew existed within me. Yes, the point that you are mentioning around visualization um, I would relate it more to reflection. Like we all have experiences, whether we go uh, to, uh, to any resort, to any vacation or in our professional lives. When we go through an experience or an event, if we are not sitting back and analyzing what we went through, we won't have any learning out, to, out of that experience. Absolutely. So, 
Well, and I, I don't think it's really a reflection. Um, and let, let me just expand on that a little bit. It's more about a visualization of where are you going? What are your goals and objectives, your aspirations? And, and visualize you actually making that happen, um, more so than from a reflection standpoint. I reflect all the time, but I've never really truly sat down and closed my eyes and had a visualization exercise of that magnitude. Um, but what I have learned from that is uh, some great things have has resulted from that. Now, is there a direct correlation between the two? I don't know. Some would say yes. Some would some would argue that that's not the case. It's just hard work and and determination. Um, but I there's a piece of me that um, spiritually I've never really tapped into um, that COVID has allowed me to tap into. So I'm excited about that transition in my life. Um, moving forward. Yes, now I have a better understanding. For visualization, you mean like what is going to happen in the future, how you can take your business in the future and seeing that like kind of again, it will be related to the bigger picture. So this is what my vision is. Before COVID, we were just having our day-to-day -day life, professional life, then personal life. And we didn't have that kind of a chance to sit back and see what we truly want to have. Like just today, we were having a dis discussion in our team that what is the ultimate goal of a sales executive or a sales professional? That all the sales that come into a company becomes organic. And by organic, that you are not doing a sales effort, people are reaching out or companies are reaching out to you. And that would be the end goal. And if we can visualize that and create a plan in order to achieve that maybe that part was missing mostly in our personal life where we see ourselves five year ten year down the road and what we need to do in order to achieve that yeah and when we uh, do our research uh, we get a constant information that is coming through the internet through social media mobile phone etc there are many individuals around us that give us a lot of advice, some might be beneficial, some might not be. But yeah. living in a world where you have such constant flow of information, how do you focus upon what's really worth for you and that can give you a clearer vision? Well, here's the thing. Here's the key below. We all have choices. You can either choose to control what you, what information you decide to receive and what information you decide to neglect. And you know, you choose that information based on, on what you're going to absorb, um, what you're going to consider, and then what you're going to discard. So every, everything in life has a choice. This is what I know to be true. I know that if you and I believe the same things, same, have the same values, the same principles, we are unstoppable together. You know, I believe that our relationships truly will make a difference in the results that you're going to achieve, um, the impact that you're going to have, and more importantly, in the speed in which opportunities will happen. So we have a choice. We can choose to annihilate our brains and our minds with information that's not really warranted to our beliefs or we can choose to allow that to come in and consume us. I also believe that in the world, you know, you talked about a constant flow of unlimited information. I believe that we really do in the world have, we don't have an ideation problem. I think there's a lot of ideas floating around in the world. I think there's, you know, people in our business, in business, we don't have a sales problem. You know, everybody says that, you know, the problem with, with growing your business is sales. Mm, I don't believe that either. I don't really believe we have a people problem. We might have a leadership problem to guide our people, but I don't believe we have a, a, a people problem either in business. And I most definitely don't think we have a marketing problem. And I know that might sound strange, but what I really believe we have is an execution problem. People are afraid to execute or they don't know how to execute. And therefore, if you don't execute, it doesn't matter if you have the greatest sales team, you have the greatest people working for you, you have the greatest marketing, you have the best ideas, but if nobody executes on them, nothing is any good. And what I also believe is that people need to be real and transparent and do the work. And when you execute, it means you got to do the work, fail or success. 
So coming back to, you know, an unlimited amount of information, I think we have choices and you choose what to filter through and take control of and you choose what not to. So uh, someone once told me that every word is worth a million dollars, but every action is worth five million. And I really, really believe that. So, you know, luckily for me, it takes several times to absorb information. So I know that kind of sounds crazy that, you know, why is that lucky? It's kind of a weakness of mine and I suck at comprehension. I really, really do. But that's actually, in my view and in my opinion, a strength. Because I have to read things over and over and over for them really to set in, I can determine whether that information is really valuable or whether or not I get, you know, um, sidetracked and do I go back to that information, meaning that the more I absorb that information, the more that it's going to stick with me and stay with me as opposed to, you know, gone forever. Um, so, you know, you have to be focused to do that. Yes, and your thoughts around execution made me realize two of the quotations that one of my John mentor, John Maxwell, shared that dreams are free, but the journey is not. Yeah. And, and yeah. good intentions that lead to good actions truly create value. So it is not that you can sit there, have things that this is the change I want to make in the world, but if you are not willing to take these steps, in order to reach there, then the intentions would have uh, no meaning at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well, it's like partnerships, right? You know, we all start out with the best intentions, don't we, in any partnership that we do. But things get in the way. And just because we started out with best intentions doesn't mean that we actually get the results we're looking for or that the partnership actually stays sustainable over a long period of time. Yes. And, and it happens like everybody is very motivated, like win-win situation. But at the time passes on, you realize that things are not working well. And that is why it is very important to have open communication at all times, whether it's personal life, professional life, and that helps us to resolve a lot of problem that might occur. Usually, yeah, people I think, yeah, I would agree. I think that, you know, most most relationships that go sideways is because of either a lack of communication or um, a lack of miscommunication, meaning that we create our own stories about the interpretation of the communication rather than just being right out transparent and asking the hard questions to get the real answers. And, and sometimes we do it out of like good intentions that we don't want to create problems so we just let it there, build it, build it up in our mind. But then when it comes out, it is not small. It is not two person. Now the brain is totally saturated. So what will come out might not be the most appropriate thing to have a communication around. So it is you have a problem, have a discussion, open up, and that builds trust as well. So yeah. all those uh, miscommunication things only happen when you're not communicating. You're keeping things to yourself. And over time, it becomes uh, very problematic and you are not trusting that person anymore. So it is well, always... It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like in a marriage, right? You can only leave the toothpaste cap off the toothpaste for so long before it starts to be a big problem. Very well articulated. Like that's uh, spot on. <laughs> and, and let's connect the thoughts to like uh, more on an individual level. We all have discouragements. We all have bad experiences, failures, fear, limiting beliefs in ourselves, lack of self-belief and everything. But on the other hand, we all have the infinite potential to create a great change in the world. But those thoughts in our mind stop us from achieving them. What are some of the ways utilized to overcome them and transform our lives in a person that we are truly meant to be in this world? Well, I think we have to embrace our experiences, right? Like, I think, I think that's, you know, one of the most important things is that we all have bad experiences and we all have great experiences. It's whether or not you learn from those experiences. 
you know, I've had bad, you know, great relationships that started out with the best intentions in the world, um, but ended badly. And we all have those experiences. And it doesn't mean that the, the other person or people are bad people or they're, you know, it just means that we didn't embrace the experience. There was a lack of communication, you know, but I'm grateful for those experiences, bad and good, especially the bad ones, because the bad ones are the ones, you know, the failures or the bad relationships or, or experiences that we had where we learned the most. Um, and it's shame on us if we don't make changes based from those experiences. But I'm grateful for every single person that's ever come into my life, you know, whether it's caused turmoil in my life or not, um, is irrelevant. I think that at some point, once the dust settles, you do become grateful because I've learned a lot um, from those experiences. And so once you get to that place, um, I think that you just keep moving forward and you don't make those same mistakes. You learn from it and you adapt your behavior according to the experience. That was very interesting. I somehow feel it can be related to the master's hierarchy and maybe when once you reach the level of self-actualization, yeah. that is when you see things from a different perspective. You are listening to understand rather than just abruptly respond to individuals. And then you take a step back, be empathetic, utilize emotional intelligence, and then you see that everybody is there in your life for a reason, good or bad. But at the end of the day, they teach you the things and the bad experiences I feel uh, are the best, best options to learn because when you have good experiences, everybody is happy. But when something is not successful, that is when you take a step back, realize what didn't work, what we can improve. And that is what um, truly makes you uh, successful and linking success. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah I, I think so because Bilal, in, um, I think accountability plays a big role in that, right? Like when we talk about our experiences, being accountable to the actions that we've taken of our own and really being objective about our actions um, and that every action that we take has a reaction. And when we realize, you know, the reaction from somebody else might not be what we expected um, is when we really get introspection on what went wrong or what went right and that's when the learning really happens but if we're never accountable for our own actions or our own reactions um we'll never learn we'll never we'll never grow we'll never expand we'll never reach uh, a higher level of frequency um if we don't be accountable and i think accountability is a big factor that a lot of people are afraid to be accountable to make making their mistakes. And yes, it makes many individuals uh, uncomfortable as well. And then growth ag yep. again happens outside of your comfort zone. And that is why it is key to have a coach. Many individuals would uh, just think uh, that coach could be an extra burden or expenses, but coach makes you aware and it's, Sometimes individuals don't know what's the difference between a mentor or a coach. Mentors would share things from their experience, but the coach, they are taking you to the next level. They are creating that awareness inside you that can help you make better decisions rather than somebody helping you uh, make those decisions. And all those individuals who have a coach or have accountability partners get the things done because they know at the end of the week, or the month, there would be someone to whom they are answerable. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. It's kind of like, you know, you think about Oprah Winfrey, for instance, you know, who's highly successful. Um, she doesn't just have one coach. She has mentors. She has advisors. She has life coaches. She has business executive coaches. She has a number of people that she turns to to help her grow, expand, you know, not just her business, but intellectually and emotionally as well. So I think you're right. Absolutely. You need somebody to be the, ask those open-ended questions, but that they don't reflect 
any of their own experiences on your experience so that to help you grow. Absolutely. And I would now ask you to introduce uh, to the audience, what is age learning and how does age learning help us to become a successful individual? Well, edge learning is a concept, you know, it's really uh, the continuous process of developing um, peripheral skills that have the most impact on a person's ability to obtain a successful and a fulfilled life. So what I mean by that is, you know, we talk about continuous learners, we talk about continuing education. This is different because it's edge learning is really not about just memorizing the facts and the statistics but it's about developing your internal and your external soft skills that happen through real world experiences and mentoring and from leading experts who have already walked in the trenches, you know, they've been down those roads. Um, those skills, you know, some will call them soft skills, um, but it isn't just the soft skills, it's the hard skills too. It's those skills that accompany the core competency of your education. Um, and so when we think about internal and external skills, you know, we think about the internal skills automatically, we think about, you know, perseverance, uh, we think about tenacity, we think, you know, about um, communication skills, we think, you know, the external skills of the harder skills. Um, but what we don't really talk about or we think about um, is this one internal skill called intelligent curiosity. Have you ever heard that term below? I have heard about curiosity and the importance of that, but not along with intelligent curiosity. Right. So, in, and rightfully, you shouldn't have heard about it because nobody talks about it, but let's talk about it. So intelligent curiosity really is a formal you know, when you don't follow a normal, formal process, you will become largely successful. And what I mean by that is normal processes are going to work for a short time, uh, but there's no consistent innovation in it. And there's no, um, the pr process eventually will be become outdated or it'll fail over or fade over time. So at, imagine this, as we age, our brains become more increasingly ingrained with familiar patterns of routines, right? Like think about our grandparents, for instance. You know, they get up at 6 a.m. and there better be breakfast at 7 a.m. And if you said you were coming to pick them up at nine o'clock to go to the grocery store, God forbid if you were there at 9.05, right? They're very much ingrained in familiar patterns and routines. But when we get comfortable in this place, we lose our ability to have intelligent curiosity. So we need to find ways to break that cycle continuously. You know, I have a, a couple mentors in my life that are in their 70s, and they're extremely highly intelligent um, and curious. Um, they don't have the regular pattern of a 70 year old where, you know, up at a certain time, you know, like my, the traditional grandparents, they ask unexpected questions to break cycles. So what I mean by that is, you know, they'll ask, what did you do differently today um, than you did yesterday? What do you going to do differently tomorrow than you did last week? And rather than asking you in a conversation, they might break the pattern of the, of the conversation by saying, write it down first. What that does is it forces you to use the right side of your brain, the creative side. That's where innovation happens. So somebody who's intelligently curious uses that side of their brain consistently. Does it make sense? Yes, it does. But you have to be careful, though, because when you are thinking about being in a, you know, intelligent curiosity or using that skill set, confirmation biases will come into play. You know, so imagine that you're trying to reach a friend, right? You pick up the phone and you call them and they don't answer. And so you try again and they don't answer and you try again and they don't answer. You start to create a story in your mind. You jump to those conclusions about maybe your friend is starting to avoid you. Naturally, our body, our mind um, 
always wants to go to the negative rather than the positive, right? Would you agree with me? I, I totally get it. And that is where lack of trust also comes in and plays its part. Absolutely. So we start to think, oh, they must be upset with me. They're avoiding me. We start to create these stories in our mind. And when we, you know, if we don't, if we start to believe in these stories, the danger of accepting these beliefs without questioning anything further, without any asking any other questions, any other questions when we don't become intelligent about the curiosity as to why they're avoiding us that's when we run into trouble that's when assumptions come into play and that's when innovation stops does it make sense yes it does and i can also relate to you an example how we did overcome this kind of a thing so last year I was part of a residency program and we were working in a team of four individuals. So how we were doing those design thinking cycles, we were having a five minute timer and we had to come up with eight ideas per person. That means it is 32 ideas in five minutes. And then what we did, we circulated our, our papers to each other. So what was with me went to some other and that is how we circulated throughout the group and had another cycle of five minutes each. What happened without no explanation, I had to take those eight ideas of other individual and make up something from what I saw, from what my mind comprehended rather than from the perspective of someone else. And yeah. after doing this exercise, after 20 minutes, we had like really diverse thing, a thing that started from something totally different ended up being something different. And that is how we were able to uh, mitigate that personal bias or uh, confirmation bias or even experience bias as you were relating to the grandparents. And, and this way we came up with very diverse ideas. And I would yeah. like to link this to younger individual fresh graduates who think that they don't have uh, experience. What experience does, it makes you an expert in one field and being a fresh graduate, you can think from all perspective and you are an ideal candidate in any innovation space and you can, your mind will be fresh with no biases, no experience from any sector. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you will come up with would be much more different than someone who is experienced in one field would be doing. Absolutely. Well, and here's the thing is, is you know, they're the perfect example of, you know, to, to set an hypothesis and then act, you know, seek out instances to prove themselves wrong, right? When we lean into the persistent desire to know more, we'll discover more. So a graduate is got an open, a blank slate, right? They have a blank slate. But for people like you and I who've had some experience and we have some wisdom behind us, we don't have that blank slate anymore. So we have to always go against the grain of our own tendencies. That's intelligent curiosity. I really like this uh, skill. And anyways, like curiosity just in general, like asking questions really helps you to learn more about what's happening around. And this is maybe these skills that somebody needs to learn. But if I just want to ask you, other than this, what would be your top five internal skills and top five external skills that you would like to share with the audience? Well, let me ask you, what do you think your top five, whether they're internal or external, um, skills are most important to you because I think what my top five would be is very different than what your top five would be. So, you know, clearly intelligent curiosity, be an eligible receiver, you know, communication skills, personality styles, um, uh, leadership, um, tenacity, perseverance, persistence. These are all skills that are, are vitally important in, and in combination and standing alone. So what would be your five? So I would start with the self-awareness. That means I need to develop myself. I need to do this 
particular step to become like successful or take the next step in my career journey from being self awareness i would see i need to have a right attitude like having a plan but if i can't execute that comes to my attitude positive attitude taking mm-hmm. actions yeah. then yeah. i have the attitude i have uh, the awareness not need to have been curious to know what's happening around my industry what i need to really do to be that next person i want to be and after curiosity i would uh, go into goal setting and then finally ended up with if i need to have top 5 with accountability there those would be my top 5 pick uh, in like an unlikely well you know what i you know what i find interesting about that not one of those was a technical skill and i think that's what the world is missing right now those edge learning skills those internal learning learning skills that you don't get when you go to a formal education you don't learn those skills uh in school you know when you're in grade 7 8 9 and 10 11 and 12 you know that's what our formal education is missing those edge learning skills that really are the ones that we drive not the 2 plus 2 equals 4 we have calculators for that now <laughs> no and that is what if i would take a step back in my career there were some projects in some were like startup so i did like an education based startup initially then i went into fashion industry then i teamed up with my friend and did a project in hr and then then had a diverse team where we worked in a medical technology industry and now i'm working on a platform empowering independent consultants those are all five different industries but uh, what is truly needed for success those things come down to yourself with the right mindset the right attitude are you able to take action uh, similarly with all online working how much are you self accountable how are you creating your own goals now and i feel those skills would become even more important these five or even the other ones that are there in order to be successful in this kind of a, a scenario Yeah, well, I th- and I think you know, there's a lot of talk or, and corporate culture right now about you know matching values and vision with your people, and it's not hiring people for their technical skills anymore. I mean, Deloitte's proven that, right? Deloitte's taking people right out of high school and teaching them the technical skills. They're saying, "Don't go to university." You know, Facebook does it, Google does it. There's so many that are saying, "You know what? We can teach you the technical skills, but the internal skills." those are hard to find we can't teach those those are crafted over a period of time but when we believe the same thing we are unstoppable i was having this discussion in the medical technology startup space where we partnered with engineers and doctors that is where we we had a different question and let me pick your brains on it <laughs> would you like to <laughs> uh i mean or let's make it general so if somebody is been operated for an open heart surgery would you like to have to have a like kind of a high school student with these skills operating on that person and that yeah. was that was a, like a tough question to answer because we were having well, I th- I don't think it's a tough question to answer. I think the answer is I want the guy that's been in the university for the last 22 years and has mastered his craft, his technical craft of open heart surgery. I think there's a time and a place for the technical hard skills. Absolutely 100%. You know, when I'm driving over the bridge, I want to I want to know that the engineer that signed off on those plans knew what he was doing he had the technical aptitude to do it but i also know um and i've been around long enough to know that the only way that that bridge is built and the only way that the heart surgery is successful is if everybody works as a team and the only way that you work as a team is not from your technical aptitudes but it is absolutely from those internal attitudes yes you are right uh, yeah that was uh, something very interesting that uh, we had a discussion around and yeah. and yeah. Every, everybody knew that uh, you need an expert you don't need an amateur doing that kind of a, a surgery as an experiment Absolutely. for the very first time yeah 
Thank you so much for sharing detail about age learning, uh, Lisa. So thank you everyone and I'm looking forward to having you all on the next episode of Skill Ranch podcast.